Kimberly Randall. Uh, and Kimberly is going to be speaking about scope three emissions and greening the supply chain. As founder and CEO of, um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I'm losing, of Fair Supply, uh, Kimberly is an experienced and innovative human rights advocate specializing in ESG and supply chains. Kimberly has over 15 years experience working in law and human rights for top tier firms in the United States and Australia. During her role as Senior Director of Corporate and Legal for International Justice Mission Australia, Kimberly was instrumental in shaping regulatory ESG reporting requirements, providing evidence for both the New South Wales and Commonwealth parliamentary inquiries into human trafficking. Fair Supply currently provides objective ESG data to tier 10 of a company's supply chain to global asset owners, fund managers, and corporations. Fair Supply has recently been awarded Insider's 2023 ESG Data Provider of the Year in APAC, named at the Goldman Sachs, Sachs Distributive um, Disruptive Tech Symposium as a company to watch in the Australian Financial Review Sustainability Leaders category innovators. Kimberly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter, for the wonderful opportunity to speak to you today. Um, my company is based in Sydney, Australia, and so I've traveled a long way to be here this afternoon. But um, it's wonderful to be here to speak about such an important topic. And it's been reiterated throughout the entire day that a missing piece to solving this puzzle is data. And so before I launch into the methodology behind Fair Supplies data, as we cover um, GDP of 98% of the world's GDP up to tier 10 of the supply chain at a macroeconomic level, I'll talk to you a little bit about how this human rights lawyer became an ESG data provider. And so as you heard, I started my career in commercial litigation in the United States. And then I pivoted to human rights when I took the position of senior director as corporate and legal at International Justice Mission. And traveling to Uganda and Bangkok and Cambodia, I got to meet survivors of forced labor abuse. And it was there I realized that forced labor and other ESG risks were actually occurring deep within a company's supply chain. It was very unlikely that the companies that um, we were purchasing from, services being provided from, or investments being made were exploiting people at the first tier of the supply chain, but rather these human rights abuses were happening deep within the supply chain. So my quest to provide visibility into global supply chains, now to measure forced labor, carbon emissions and biodiversity risk really came from a simple um, theory of change, which is you can't fix what you can't see. When I started Fair Supply, I just assumed that there would be a technology provider whereby companies could upload their specific investment portfolios, their asset types, their securities, their spend data, and that risks could be identified beyond tier one of the supply chain. But learning um, about the problems of existing data providers became apparent very, very quickly. And the four problems with them were touched and very well articulated this morning, but just in case you've forgotten in the six hours, I'll go through them again because they've been well documented not only in peer reviewed papers, but also by the OECD. And that is that ESG data, especially carbon data is subjective and largely based on what companies are reporting about themselves. So take two companies, for example, both are using entirely different methodologies to measure scope one, scope two emissions, and maybe not even measuring scope three. I'll get to scope three in a minute. Each company is using an entirely separate methodology and reporting numbers in which trillions of dollars of investment decisions are being made. What could possibly go wrong? I heard the example before that this type of subjectivity in the methodology in which carbon um, emissions are being reported can be um, can be similar to 
you're asking your child what they did wrong. The answer is not likely to be consistent, but rather um, reported through the lens of the methodology in which companies are using, which can be different from each other. There's significant risk in um, doing this. The other issue, and I'll, I'll touch on scope three now, is that scope three emissions are essentially defined by the greenhouse gas protocol as anything beyond scope two emissions. So an example of the subjectivity and even reporting scope three emissions is that you could have one company who accounts for everything from production to consumption in their scope three emissions and another company that reports scope three as scope two plus three tiers down or scope three plus one tier down. So the inconsistency of reporting is really the basis for trillions of dollars being moved through the economy. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much time on outlining the significant problems with investment decisions being made on such subjective data. Instead, I'm going to present you with um, Fair Supply Solution. Okay, so you may all be familiar with how scope three is calculated by applying, um, applying emissions factors. I'll just take you through it very briefly. Essentially, emissions factors are multiplied with the expense and are meant to encompass all upstream scope three emissions for the corresponding um, expense. So we might have a client who is purchasing electricity, transport, um, production, and essentially applying emissions factors is a very well-established approach. The methods to determine emissions, the, but, the, the, but the methods to determine those emissions are largely related to factors unknown. And a big unknown factor related to these emissions factors is what country the emissions are what country the carbon is being emitted from and what industry the carbon is being emitted from. Supplier-specific mitigation measures also cannot be considered by just applying emissions factors to calculate scope three carbon emissions. And supplier-specific supply chains cannot be considered. So in circumstances where you have the same uh, two different companies in the same industry and country, what one company is doing to mitigate their emissions um, or use alternate supply chain pathways to measure their emissions is not being taken into account in just applying emissions factors. I've actually just put a picture up there about the complexity of global supply chains. So to move mindsets away from supply chains being linear, especially um, supply chains being linear, supply chains of securities being linear, we need to start thinking about supply chains as multi uh, trees with multifaceted branches. Because if you think of the number of financial transactions between industries and countries occurring when you make a trade or purchase a product, it looks more like this. And for every, um, for every purchase you make or for every investment you make, there's complex global supply chains and economic inputs from many different industries and countries feeding into each tier of the supply chain. So if you think of supply chains as a detailed decomposition of emission factors into individual supply chains, in our view, that is the most robust way of measuring scope three emissions. To measure scope three emissions at each node of global supply chains provides a full overview of the contributions that actually go into the scope three emissions factors. And then when I'm talking about scope three emissions factors, I'm talking about the 15 categories under the TCFD. So we're not just applying um, an emissions factor that may be publicly available and then scaled by GDP. We're actually analyzing each node of the supply chain. This offers the possibility to refine the emissions factor and rework. So for example, turning different supply chains on and off. 
And this gets really interesting when you start to play around with it because you can actually turn um, countries, supply chains of individual countries on and off based on predicted geopolitical factors um, or other things that you're trying to quantify as investment analysts. It also means that many emission, um, it, it also means that specific parts of the supply chains are based on new data and information. So when companies mitigate um, their carbon emissions, we're able to put that in on a company specific basis um, to the relevant supply chain. And the many emissions factors are actually based on the input output models that we hold. So just to recap in the difference between measuring emissions at each tier of the supply chain to calculate scope three emissions and get a holistic view at each node from production to consumption, as opposed to an opaque, not really understanding what part of the supply chain is being measured um, to calculate scope three, um, scope three emissions. Fair Supply has used an integrated assessment engine which follows the same philosophy as the emission factors approach but offers a more insight, detail and options to further refine those emissions analysis. We solve the problem by using objective data sets. So all underlying data, whether it's economic supply chains or emissions data, are sourced from official data providers, not self-reported data providers. So these include the national statistical agencies of 197 countries, UN statistics divisions, Eurostat, and all economic data is compiled actually according to the UN systems of national accounts. All emissions data is provided by the individual countries, which in return compile these according to the UNFCCC standards. Our unique hybrid approach means that our engine can accommodate as much client-specific data as we have access to. So no longer are we just measuring companies' efforts to report carbon emissions based on what they're doing to mitigate exposure, but we're actually combining that, um, combining that information with the objective data that we own. And this allows our clients to insert company-specific information into the supply chain engine. So what do company specific emissions factors look like, which is essentially our model. It could also be used to determine the client specific emission factors, but then we would have the capability to, um, the looser capability to address specific supply chains for detailed assessments. We can also apply this system to calculate downstream emissions. You can see that the up, that the upstream impacts of downstream have impacts on downstream supply chain. So we've addressed this to mitigate any risk of double counting. You can see an example of here where an example of where downstream emissions can have an impact in upstream supply chain and that scope two and scope three emissions associated with the processing of sold products in tier two. So by taking a unified approach, the same source data sets and company specific information, we essentially mapped the entire global economy. We did this in terms of our underlying data sets by taking the national accounts of every statistical agency from 197 um, companies and optimizing them using input output analysis to trace 60 billion supply chains. That is our core IP. Our use case is being able to quantify scientifically carbon emissions, forced labour and species impact along the entire supply chain of investment portfolios and procurement data. I'll take some questions. Questions for Kim. This one. one at the back, way at the back. Mm -hmm. Sure, go ahead and I'll repeat it. <laughs> 
So the question is, just so everybody can hear it, the question is not for large purchases like an airplane ticket, but for small incremental purchases on a day-to-day -day basis, how can consumers or businesses understand the impact yeah. and quantify, quantify And so the transparency over the supply chain is key to that because before you before you measure emissions, you have to understand what the supply chain of that burger or can of soda is from production to consumption. So let's take a car, for example. We could measure everything from the extraction of iron ore in Australia to the transportation, the emissions involved in the transportation to China, to the manufacturing of steel, to the production of the car, to the transport of car, to the actual consumer. And then you can start to quantify emissions along each tier of that supply chain and report it you can, you can isolate whatever part of the supply chain you want. If you're only concerned in kind of the emissions of you the buying the burger from McDonald's and eating, or if you want to measure it to the actual extraction of raw materials or production of raw materials, and then you start to overlay each node of the supply chain with emissions factors to get that quantifiable result. So we can do that. Yes, our technology can do that. Next question. Yeah. Ted Carmiller, Responsible Alpha. Thank you for the great presentation. Do you see any like gaps in data availability for the building sector and, and sectors that are adjacent between the EU, the United States and other places internationally? Yeah, so the part that I, yes. Yes, there are huge data gaps because the data that we are getting from each country is only reliable as the data that is produced by each country at first instance. So we have to go through a long process of mathematical optimization and so draw from 250 different data sources to kind of figure out what reliability metrics are put around each country's data. So if you think of, I don't know, I'm always a little bit sceptical to use Australian metaphors <laughs> on Wall Street. But if you, if you think of um, putting a case of beer on a trampoline. <laughs> I think I'm just um, diminishing all credibility and, you know, jumping up and down and having to balance it with different mathematical optimization techniques to ensure that the data that we're relying on from each com company can be verified by multiple different data sources. Got it. Thank you. 